7 p.m. in India, 9 p.m. in Singapore, 3 p.m. and well past bedtime for our colleagues in Australia. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends. Warm welcome to everyone. I'm Anupam Sibyl. I'm uh, the Group Medical Director for Polo Hospitals, a pediatric gastroenterologist and the President of Gov. For those who are joining us for the first time, the Global Indian Fusion COVID-19 Collaborative was established on 11th April to bring together 1.4 million globe on now has 45 it's day 173 since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed. COVID-19 has now been reported from more than 200 countries and territories. 8.7 million cases have been recorded and sadly with more than 460,000 deaths. An explosion of knowledge has taken place about COVID like never before and till date 24,284 papers have been published with 140 papers per day and more than 1,000 papers have been published just from India. Today, we'll be discussing women's our distinguished panel of experts from across the globe. And we're going to begin by inviting Dr. Alpesh Gandhi uh, for his opening remarks. Uh, Alpesh is a senior consultant in obstetrics and gynecology and is the current president of Foxy. Uh, he's uh, been associated with creating the guidelines for uh, establishing obstetric high dependency units and ICUs by the government of India. He's written a very popular book on the principles of critical care in obstetrics and he has an honorary fellowship of the RCOG. Over to Dr. Alpesh Gandhi for his opening remarks. Dr. Alpesh, just unmute. So, so many, uh, you know, messages are also coming. Whenever someone joins, then the uh, message is there. Thank you very much, Dr. Anupam, for the kind introduction. And I am thankful to the organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to begin the session. Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the viewers of different parts of the world. Dr. Anupam has uh, rightly mentioned about the coronavirus COVID-19 epidemic. I would like to take this opportunity of two minutes to introduce all of you what Foxy has done in India to tackle this uh, epidemic, endemic, pandemic we can say across the world. We all know that COVID-19 pandemic is upon us as one of the biggest health challenge of the century and it's a global crisis and we all are not spared. The novel infection brings uncertainty with it. The pressure is not only of the numbers or of heavy workload, but also dealing with an unknown pathogen and limitations of the infrastructure. We also immediately foresee that it will be inevitable that we will be caring for pregnant women infected with COVID-19. And we also foresee that it's a long fight. We immediately declare that Foxy cannot stop academics and we moved to digital platform for the updating of the epidemic uh, of the academics to our members regarding the COVID-19 and other important issues. We immediately release our first and second sort advisory. Second advisory was released on 25th March. What to do in routine practice, what not to do in our routine practice and for the use of telemedicine, we immediately also publish our GCPR on pregnancy with COVID-19 to guide and help our members for dealing with such patients. It was brought within a shortest time of only nine days which was very much appreciated by WHO, UNICEF, ICMR, SAFO, medical colleges and our members with a positive feedback and valuable opinions. It was a proud moment for Foxy when our Prime Minister has invited us for video conference meeting on 24th March and he has heard our suggestions 
we have started our national registry on pregnancy with covid 19 infection it is a simple registry it's easy to fill it takes only 10 minutes and we are receiving very good response from many colleges and our members it is also very well appreciated by figo as well as safog and many other uh, organizations alpesh we are having a problem with your audio alpesh we are having a problem with your audio you're going to have to uh, check we've lost you in the last 30 seconds Oh, okay, okay. Let me check here. It is shown that uh, audio is continue. Uh, one minute. Let me check. No, we we are hearing good. You know, we are hearing very well. Okay, so I think that's a yeah. Alpesh, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Foxy, we can't Foxy. hear you, Alpesh. Uh, remaining we can't are... hear you. Other other can hear me well. Yeah. Most so of I us think it's a local problem. problem. Actually, we can't hear Anupam Sibal right. very clearly. There's a Carry break on. in the news. Uh, so we have started our national registry on protection. A simple registry, easy to fill. It takes only 10 minutes. We uh, collected a good number of cases and it is also appreciated by FIGO and many other countries, organizations. Foxy has also planned a focus one complete week in the month of April or the COVID-19 in different obstetric and gynecological conditions to uh, update knowledge of our members. Also came out with FAQ for uh, so many queries of uh, healthcare providers and our patients. So we uh, want to sensitize them and solve their anxiety and queries. So we came out with FAQs in different languages of India. So we came out in different eight languages of India, the FAQ. We also conducted a joint study with ICMR on the prophylaxis role of hydroxychloroquine in healthcare provider. And we also came out, uh, we have done one MOU with UNICEF to continue the services, essential maternity and neonatal services and quality care during the time of COVID-19. And recently we declared that we are also coming out with the GCPR of COVID-19 in different obstetric gynecological conditions like uh, endoscopy, family planning and oncology and others. Uh, all the experts are the part of this uh, GCPR, Dr. Prakash Bhai, Nandita, Santa Kumari, all are also the part of this uh, GCPR. So I'm happy to see all of them here. And Foxy, I hope it will be remembered for its vision to foresee the long fight, its prompt and proactive actions taken to take care of our Foxians and Indian women. With this, I once again thank you for all of you for facing this, uh, facing this enormous challenge and responding to it with courage, resolve and explanatory, exemplary professionalism. Please take care. And with this, once again, thank you very much for inviting me, giving me this opportunity. I wish all of you a very good session and happy learning, a great learning and a great day. Thank you very much. Anupam, you can please continue. I think Anupam. Dr. Anupam has some problem. I think Dr. Anupam have completed my math. Hello. Is there anyone from technical agency side? I think Anupam has frozen. Hmm. Uh, Dr. 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 Kandan, you know. can you please Thank start? Thank you, Dr. Alpesh Gandhi. Thank yes. you very much. I think Dr. Anupam has. Uh, slight uh, difficulty with the audio. So, thank you very much. Now, may I invite uh, Dr. Sudhir Parekh to moderate the next two talks. And Dr. Sudhir Parekh. Dr. Sudhir Parekh is Padam Shiri and is chairman and publisher of Parekh Worldwide Media and ITV Gold 24 into 7 TV channel in United States of America. And he is Secretary General of Global Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. He was decorated with Pravasi Bhartiya Samman, Alice of Island Medal of Honor and title of Knights of Malta. Dr. Sudhir Parekh, kindly introduce the next two speakers, please.
डॉक्टर सुधीर अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ Yes, Dr. Sudhir, can you introduce? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello? Okay, great. Again, uh, dear friends, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to uh, Gapio Institute, uh, along uh, with the collaboration of the API. Uh, let me. It's my honor and privilege to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Sunita Reddy. Dr. Sunita Reddy is a board-certified OB/GYN consultant, and is she is practicing in Springfield, Ohio. Dr. Sunita is trained at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, and Sunita is not Dr. Sunita is not only take care of uh, high-risk obstetric patients, but also specializes in laparoscopy surgery. Let's welcome Dr. Sunita Reddy. Dr. Sunita Reddy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for sharing your chat with us. Well, my talk today is about office management with OBGYN. Well, I live in Ohio. I practice, I know, slight correction. I practice in Kettering Medical Center in Kettering, Ohio. Well, you know, my, my segment, my, my talk is two segments. How did we practice OBGYN during the lockdown? And how are we practicing now after the lockdown? Well, during the lockdown, obviously, we were not seeing patients for routine checkups. We were doing medication refills online. And we were doing a lot more telehealth visits. For minor issues, obviously, telehealth was the perfect way to provide care to our patients. But moving on to the post-lockdown time, how are we doing things now? Well. How it starts in the office is with, it starts with telephone triage. This is a very, very important part of our practice. When a patient calls for an appointment, obviously they're asked questions like, why do you want to come in? And then on top of it, they're asked, do you have a fever? Do you have a cold and cough? If say a patient answers in the positive, then they're directed to the nearest COVID drive, drive through center to be tested. And obviously, they're given other precautions of, you know, making, you know, following quarantine recommendations and such. But a patient, say, now answers in the negative and they're ready to be seen in the office. A high priority recommendation is given to the next, that they have to wear a mask slash a facial covering when they come for an appointment. Now, a patient shows up without a facial cover or a mask. What do we do in the office? Well, we provide them with a mask. They're either surgical masks or cloth, cloth masks. So another important issue that comes up for all of us as we practice post-lockdown is what do we do if a patient refuses to wear a mask? Well, I am a private practitioner, so I have the right to refuse to see a patient if they do not wear a mask. Now, again, I'm not talking in the realm of doctors who are employed in certain federal situations like VAs and other employed positions. But as a private practitioner, you can refuse to see a patient who does not want to follow uh, recommendations. Now, obviously, it is, again, very important to follow social distancing in the office. Uh, we make sure that uh, we schedule fewer patients at any given time. Now, universal precautions. All our medical staff has to wear gloves and has to wear masks when dealing with patients. Now, how do I practice medicine? How do I see a patient? Well, before I see any patient, this is how I get prepared. I wear a surgical cap, I wear eye protection, I wear an N95 mask, and I wear a surgical mask on top of the N95 mask to protect myself. And obviously, I'm working in scrubs, and then I have gloves on. This is how I see any patient and every patient. Now, you know, there is a talk about how four mites this infection, again, in a hospital setting or in an extended care facility setting. So wiping down all surfaces, exam tables and chairs in, a, in every office is very, very important. And an integral part of my role as a physician that I see is that I have to take a few additional minutes 
to educate my patients on personal protective strategies. I see that the, this is a very, very important role for all physicians, especially in America when there is issues with fake news and rumors of hoax and stuff like that. I have to take the time to tell the patient that this is the new reality, that this is a serious reality, and they have to be aware of how to protect themselves. We try to limit the number of medical students and nursing students who come to the office. We also try to tell our patients not to bring visitors and companions with them, if possible. Now, of course, office management of acutely ill patients, possible rupture topics, heavy vaginal bleeding, severe pelvic pain. These patients have to be seen in person, in lockdown and after lockdown. What do we do with patients who have under investigations, patients under investigations? Well, you have to have a, a protocol ready in the office, like how you shut down an office, how you make sure that you, you inform all the people who have come in contact with such patients. Now, another revelation to us is we were all being told that contact tracing was being done in the country. The revelation I'm talking to you about is there is no contact tracing done at the hospital I work in, and there's no contact tracing being done in any hospital in our region. Well, moving on to office practice, how do we take care of contraceptive services? If an IUD has expired or if an explanon has expired, well, their contraceptive protection goes on a little bit longer than their expiration date. So you can rest assured patients that they are still protected for a little bit time. In the meantime, you could talk to them about getting birth control patches or birth control rings. How do we manage abnormal pap smears in the office? Anybody who has mild cervical dysplasia can wait up to six months to get medical care. But anybody who has a higher grade cervical dysplasia should get care within three months. How do we manage OB patients in the office? Well, the first appointment should be a telehealth appointment. This is the time where you will figure out if they're low risk or high risk. All high risk OB patients have to be seen before 11 weeks of pregnancy. Now, for low-risk patients, we can skip their 16, 24, and 34-week in-person appointments and make them telehealth appointments. For patients who have blood pressure issues, preeclampsia issues, instead of having them come to the office frequently, we can train them to check blood pressures at home and report to the US. What do we do about non-stress tests and biophysical profiles? Well, obviously, for very high-risk patients, they have to be continued to be done in person. But for low- and medium-risk patients, these can be extended. The interval can be extended a, little, extended a little bit longer. Well, in a nutshell, this is my talk about office management at the current times. I hope that my talk was relevant and pertinent to all of you today. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Sunita. Over to Suri Bhai for the next session. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Dear friends, uh, really it's a privilege and honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Nandita Palsetkar. Dr. Nandita Palsetkar has over 25 years of experience in IVF practice, and she's director of 8 Bloom IVF chain. She has been a pioneer in the field of infertility in the last three decades and introduced various technology for the first time in India, like assisted laser hatching, uh, uh, selected sperm injection scope, and egg bank. She is also immediate past president of Federation of uh, Obstetric and Gynecology Society of India. Dr. Nandita has published many research papers and written uh, few, uh, quite a few chapters in different uh, books uh, about IVF. Dr. Nandita is a convener of GAPIO Women's Forum. Let's welcome Dr. Nandita Pals Palsetkar. Dr. Nandita. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, at the onset, I'd really like to thank Dr. Anupam Sibal and Dr. Chandan for inviting me here. <clears throat> and. Uh, it's really a pleasure. First of all, it was really great listening to our president, Dr. Alpesh talk. Uh, you know, Foxy is a great organization. And I think it's given me a 
platform in which we participate in a lot of things and i think covid has been something that has really uh, troubled us i think my laptop has hung on me it's just not going forward can you see it no we can just see your opening slide uh, i know your... it's not moving forward at all i am so sorry and i um so um so can you manage without it or uh, shall we uh, go to someone else and come back to you nandita just double click it go to the left lower side left lower side there will be an arrow okay she's just rejoining Nandita are you back in? Ah okay I'm back in now I can unmute. Okay I'll just share my screen sorry about that. Uh share screen what is happening there's something really I am really struggling with this. Can I just give my talk? I don't need this. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. And hearing you. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, telemedicine and IVF is what I'm going to talk about. I've been practicing medicine uh, IVF for the last 25 to 30 years now, and I think IVF is something that uh, you, you know during this era it was considered as a non-emergency service. and there was a lot of discussion that how can you put it on a back burner because there are lots of situations where women are growing older their ovarian reserve is lower and that's why all the associations all over the world and in fact i'm very happy to have our president dr prakash to be the but we formed guidelines from isr that we could probably now start because there are certain emergency situations and IVF uh, was very good with telemedicine. You know, telemedicine actually began. Let's think of it in eighteen seventy six. The uh, invention of telephone by Alexander Graham Bell, and in fact, uh, in nineteen sixty, the NASA started the telemedicine, and in two thousand, telemedicine came to our phones. The personal tele uh, talking and skyping and WhatsApp, etc. And if you look at Twenty, we have we expected to be a thirty-five billion dollar business, and I think that's where it's going to stay. So, first of all, what does telemedicine include? I think if in our country, especially, we are using WhatsApp, we're using phone calls, we're using Facebook Messenger, Zoom, Skype, various other social media platforms, and we are really using it to talk with the patient. we can talk to the patient on the video audio or text the first most important part of telemedicine is patient identification you know that is really important and also the medical council of india which in march laid down the guidelines that telemedicine is now legally permitted initially uh, we had instructions from the indian medical association not to communicate over whatsapp with patients but after the covid era we were able able to communicate with them and i think the consent is very important when it's an implied consent that means the patient has you know wanted uh, the tele consulting and they have initiated the consent but explicit consent is required when we call up the patient sorry i had put an alarm for 5 minutes so when we call up the patient uh, to uh, tell them that uh, we need to talk to you we need to consult you so consent is very important then you have to quickly assess the uh, emergency care is needed or not so when you consult the patient if emergency care is needed what you one should do is just just give first aid over the telemedicine if possible and ask them to contact their nearest healthcare sub provider so they should go to the casualty or the emergency department and if <coughs> emergency care is not required then i normally consult chat with the patient take their history investigations etc now in case uh, of uh, this my next slides will be questions and all but also remember one thing that if uh, i want to start the patient in ivf it's generally 
I need surgical therapy or I give supplements or I give, do IUI or IVF. In case of supplements, there is a list of supplements which the Indian Medical Association has put it as list O, which is safe to prescribe in telemedicine. Then, you know, list A, which is prescribed in the first consult, uh, which is a video consult or a refill, which we can do. And list B is the follow-up. Uh, you know, after a first in-person consultation. And there's a prohibited list which comes with the schedule X of the drug, which we are not allowed. I think these are the simple points which we must remember. Then once we have talked to the patient, I'll go on to my next slide. So history, name, age, menstrual history, obstetric history, medical history, investigations, like basic investigations, hormonal tests, ultrasounds, even this is all that we advise. And in India, fortunately, all these uh, facilities are available and patients can go in for a consult. <clears throat> you know, what I have noticed in uh, IVF is those patients who have consulted me before are happy to continue. But today morning, I got a call from a patient, doctor, is it safe to do, uh, you know, to do an embryo transplant? I think question which all of us need to tackle because a lot of counseling is done in the first study consult and you need to tell them that we don't have any instructions that you should not get pregnant during COVID times naturally but in case of IVF you need to understand that there is not enough studies you know whatever literature that I have gone through so far does not actually say that, uh, you know, uh, the COVID uh, virus does not transmit in utero. There is still a question mark. Most of the earlier studies showed that amniotic fluid, the blood, cord blood, etc., the vaginal secretions did not contain COVID virus. But nowadays, the studies which have been done on semen, in fact, it's a June 2020 publication in our Fertility Sterility Journal, which actually says that in the semen of 37 patients, they found absolutely no COVID virus. The problem with this is it's very small, so we really can't uh, tell our patients. And the whole thing is all the gametes, the eggs, the embryos, and the sperms, and the uterus has ACE2 receptors. So potentially and theoretically, you could get infected. But uh, so far, it has not been seen. And this is actually, uh, you know, uh, post-mortem was done on these patients and they actually looked at all the organs and they did not find any COVID virus. So I think we can, at this moment, we can, I counseled her that at this moment, I cannot say whether the gametes will be infected or not. We are taking full care that the staff will not infect you, but you have to take a decision. And if you want to be absolutely safe, I think one or two years is what we are looking at till the vaccine comes in. So I think this is very important part. Then the follow-up consultation is usually with reports and a triage questionnaire. Because see, in our field of IVF, the patient needs to come to the clinic and we need to uh, see her to do the process, like IUI or IVF. So the triage questionnaire and the pre-medication is something that I have prescribed these days over the telephone. And of course, after checking the report, so the LF the KFT, you know, we check for uh, general uh, health before giving all the supplements to the patients. <clears throat> I was just reading the ESHRAE guidelines uh, and they were saying that you should not use immunosuppressive therapy for COVID uh, during the COVID era for IVF because one, uh, they are not proven and uh, so we don't know the effect that it will have on the patient, whether it will make them more vulnerable to COVID. So that should be absolutely avoided at the moment. There is an ART triage questionnaire which we ask our patients. You know, uh, my previous speaker definitely spoke about the triage questionnaire, and that is done over the teleconsultation, over the phone. And uh, a lot of times I I have started my clinic now and we send this questionnaire by email. So I think any form of, form of communication can be used. And in this, there are simple questions like, have you been sick in the last two weeks? Do you have fever? Are you coughing? Do you have a sore throat? Loss of all the, uh, you know, uh, signs and symptoms of COVID. Then have you traveled? Do you work in a hospital or a nursing home? Have you been in contact with somebody? Do you live in a household with somebody who has a symptom? Have you been to functions? And also what we are doing with our team at the hospital is we've created three teams. 
and the teams are working every 15 days and one team is on uh, standby so we have one doctor one embryologist one nurse one uh, ward boy or uh, you know one technician so this team works for the first 15 days if any of them fall sick that whole entire team is taken up aside and the next team is put in place but each team will work and and in fact in india a lot of people come from very far away in bombay you know my staff comes has to travel two hours travel by public transport to come so what i have done is i have made a, a you know provision for them to stay at the hospital so that for 15 days they can live at the hospital they can work and then they can go back so in this way we are protecting our patients we are protecting our staff because if they travel by public transport you know there's a very high chance that they can get infected so this is the way we do and after the triage the decision making is there so if the patients are triage negative you know in our country we are not allowed to do covid tests uh, left right and center and we don't have the antibody testing yet so if the patient is triage negative i think we can include them in our ivf practice if they are triage positive then obviously we exclude them and we go ahead so if they are included in our practice for iui we just do two visits of sonography and for IUI, IVF it's just three to four visits. Patients have to take appointments. We are seeing every patient half an hour. You know there is a half an hour interval between two patients so that there's no crowding. Patients are made to sit in the car if they can come early. So they are not allowed to come into the hospital. They have to wear masks. They have to uh, you know there are sanitizers everywhere in the hospital. And as uh, my previous friend said, that we wipe down every part where the patient has sat down so that sanitization is done. and minimum 6 feet in all directions all reports all papers are sent via mail whatsapp or any teleconsultation tool that we have absolutely uh, taken off the files from there even the doctor prescribes is on whatsapp or you know via email and uh, you can just send a picture if you don't have the uh, you know the software for the tele consulting but there are a lot of softwares today which you can utilize and they're very good of course all the patients have to sanitize their hands prior to entering the opd all the procedures iui or ivf we keep a gap of 45 minutes to 1 hour between each patient and if possible you know stay uh, i think we should have one anesthetist for our ivf because what happens is the what we are worried about is the anesthetist moving from different ot to ot so i think it can it's worthwhile to work with one person not have a team which is very mobile so we really tried and restricted to do that so i'd like to end my talk by saying that telehealth can reduce the burden of travel it improves the access for people in rural or remote areas reduces accommodation and parking costs reduces stress reduces wash big thing that all these advantages will apply in the post covid era and i think it's definitely worthwhile for us doctors also because a lot of time we can work remotely and handle a lot of patients so i think it's a win win situation telehealth is here to say it is a win win situation in fact i just want to quote a study which was done in 2017 in america where 55% of the patients said they were not comfortable with uh, you know uh, with telemedicine and uh, actually uh, Sixty-five uh, percent said they would like it if they met the doctor the first time. I think now in the COVID era, I have seen a complete change. So if we take this survey now, probably we have a lot of patients who will say, "Oh, look, I'd rather do telemedicine consultation than go to the clinic uh, and meet the doctor because they are worried about being exposed in the hospitals, etc." So definitely, uh, time has come for a change, and we need to all adapt to this. In fact, a doctor today, you know, I had a lovely picture with the doctor with all the technology with the backpack on his back and everything so we are going to be the tech savvy uh, physicians of tomorrow and i think this is a beautiful technology and you know our uh, president uh, abdul kalam has always said technology is for the benefit of healthcare and we must use it it's an amazing tool i would just like to end my talk by telling everybody i think this is covid era we need to be kind even on the telemedicine you know don't get agitated don't get irritated by your patients when they call you 
I always say, be talk to them very sympathetically. Be empathetic to them because a lot of them are, you know, really traumatized that they want to do their treatment. They don't know whether to do it now. So I think it's really important to be empathetic, be patient, take consents, and maintain records. I think it's very, very important in this era. Thank you so much, Nandita. Really appreciate your taking time out and, and guiding us through telemedicine's here to stay. And actually, in many ways, it's going to make life a lot easier for us. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Sudhir Bhai, for doing the intros. And we move on to uh, our next moderator. That's Dr. Seema Arora. Seema is a dear friend, both certified in internal medicine and uh, medical aesthetics practices in Massachusetts. Uh, she's current chair, board of trustees of uh, the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, past president of... Uh, the Indian Medical Association of New England, past president of the Lady Harding Medical College Alumni Association of America, and she's the co-chair, along with Nandita, of the Women's Forum of Kapio. Over to you, uh, Seema. Thank you, Anupam, for that kind introduction. So now I'm going to introduce Professor Shanta Kumari, and it's my pleasure to do, do that. Uh, she's going to speak on pregnancy on COVID-19. Professor Shanta Kumari is a senior consultant of OBGYN and laparoscopic surgeon at Yashoda Hospitals, Hyderabad. Professor Shanta Kumari is president of elect of Federation of Obstetric and Gynecological Societies of India for the year 2021. Professor Shanta Kumari, please take over. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to... Can you see the screen? Yeah, wonderful. Just go on to... Uh, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, friends. I think that was a wonderful uh, introduction for this wonderful program. Well, uh, Foxy, you know, is now at the forefront trying to take care of women's health. And I have been given this job of trying to talk mm -hmm. about pregnancy in COVID in five minutes. I think that is something which is going to be fantastic. Well, friends... <laughs> What is it that uh, we are looking at? We, obstetrician gynecologists, are a different sect. We are not like the medicine physicians and all. We are not dealing with patients. We are dealing with simple, normal women who come with a normal condition pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a disease. So that is the reason why we are very, very, uh, what to say, at the a point where we have to advise our colleagues based on the available evidence. We have just heard hundreds of papers being rolled out in a matter of two months. We had the FOXI GCPR guideline and of course the expert advice which comes every other day with a newer twist. So priorities to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 to pregnant women, provision of safe, personalized and women-centered care during pregnancy, birth and postnatal period during this pandemic. And most important is the protection of healthcare personnel. Remember, all of you obstetrician gynecologists are very important. You have to be safe because you have to deliver so many women. See, I come from this Telangana state where 50,000 women are delivered every month, both in the public and private sector. So when you look at the effect of pregnancy, we find that pregnant women actually do not appear more likely to contract the infection than the general population as on today. Most women experience very mild symptoms, we know. And the effect on fetus, as Nandita just said, we're really not sure. Only sporadic reports of placental transmission reported, but we never know. So we are very wary about advising women. And women ask, can I become pregnant? So we have to be a little cautious because nobody knows what is right right now. And now studies are coming in showing that probably the, this COVID infection is associated more with hypercoagulability. And we know pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. So we need to be more clear in how we take care of women who are in this hypercoagulable state during this pandemic. I just want to show you two scenarios what has happened in pregnancy. In a public sector hospital on the 2nd of uh, May, in uh, young primary was actually admitted. All the triage which Sunita has told has been done. Triage was negative, investigated. BP was increasing. They thought it was a mild PIH. And then as the, the, the preeclampsia was 
increasing, it became severe, they decided to terminate. And uh, they followed the protocol. They did the mechanical dilatation, survey prime, everything in isolation room. At that point, she developed a light fever and cough, which actually subsided within a few hours. And they thought it was a side effect of induction. They continued the induction and she was shifted into the eclampsia room, closely monitored. Then they realized that she developed tachypnea, tachycardia, fever, and meconium stain. So they decided that they need to do cesarean section. And after the post-operative period, they did COVID and that was positive. Remember, we are not doing COVID tests for all the pregnant women who are delivering. Now, the level of precautions was not very sure. The patient was put on ventilator for six days, recovered and discharged. But look at the scenario in the hospital. Unfortunately, postgraduate students, nurses who attended the patient tested positive. And the number increased for six, then nine. So I think now we need to contemplate where is it that we have gone wrong? Could we have prevented this? There was another scenario. On 19th May, a young 26-year-old woman, third gravida, with previous two sections came in shock. What happens in a shock? Everybody rushed. They had PPE on and all. The anesthetists, the residents, everyone, massive transfusion protocol. They diagnosed the rupture uterus. They resuscitated, the laparotomy, everything then hysterectomy, patient was shifted to the RICU. Later, the report came positive for COVID. Unfortunately, they lost the woman. Well, friends, doctors, one case, the first case, they did use PPEs. The other case, they also used, but in the emergency melee, we really don't know what level has happened. So we need to look at it like, though the step-by standard precautions are taken, is there something which we have missed? How is it that we can take care of our women and how is it that we can take care of ourselves in this pandemic? So what is the advice we need to give for all the obstetric services, caring for women? Remember, reducing the transmission. So most of the women are uh, usually told to maintain all the routine protocols. And it is very important that they, we take care of women with PPE. And particularly remember, induction of labor only when appropriate. Don't jump and do inductions and other things without uh, the necessity. Mode of delivery actually only according to obstetric indications. And the mode of birth should not be influenced by the COVID infection unless the respiratory condition demands. But most important, remember, please don't keep the patient for long period of time, prolonged time in the hospital because many things can happen. You either deliver them or send them back. And probably now at this junction, we need not get worried about the cesarean section rates when you're dealing with this pandemic. That doesn't mean we're going to do cesarean for every woman, but we have to be very cautious. So friends, most important for my junior colleagues, one of my friends from Mumbai had told this, very important, please stop the habit of getting together, celebrating birthdays in the hospitals. Remember, being young isn't preventive. Minimize contact time with the patient, attendants, and your fellow colleagues. And don't neglect your PPE. You need to update yourself with what is happening. Every day, new data is coming. And you could be the next person if you do not follow instructions. And we need you to be safe, to take care of all the women who are delivering. We have to be responsible as we are the frontline workers and we have to lead by example. So friends, pregnancy is a very beautiful phase. All obstetricians have to take care of themselves before taking care of others. So I think that is how we need to take care of our women in this pandemic. Thank you. Yes. Seema, just unmute yourself. Seema, unmute yourself. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you, Professor Shanta Kumari, for that wonderful talk. Uh, now I'm going to take the honor of introducing the next speaker. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Anita Call, And her talk is about COVID-19 and fetal medicine. So Dr. Anita Call is currently the head of Apollo Center for Fetal Medicine and at Indra Prastha Apollo Hospitals, New Delhi. Dr. Anita has been instrumental in introducing a certified training and quality assurance course in mucal scanning and obstetric ultrasound offered by Fetal Medicine Foundation in UK. Dr. Anita is the president of Fetal Medicine Foundation India and is also running a two-year fellowship program on fetal medicine. 
She is also a national examiner in India for the Fetal Medicine Foundation, UK. Over to Dr. Anita Kaur. Thank you all very much and good evening, everyone. Um, Um, uh, what I want to say, much like all my earlier speakers have said, that the interaction between COVID-19 and the fetus is at its infancy. We don't know as much as we should. Um, um, because unlike what Anupam said, I mean, there may be a thousand papers which have come out on COVID from India, but unfortunately not enough from fetal medicine. So we have very limited uh, literature. We have mainly case reports and small series, and even the systematic reviews which have come up have barely looked at about 200 cases. So I thought that I'd run this talk through how, what are the clinical implications for us um, in the fetal medicine units. So the first thing is, of course, the safety of healthcare workers during scanning, because we believe it's a very high risk situation. We are in uh, smaller rooms. We are in close contact with the patients. Most of the scans take about a half an hour to 40, 45 minutes. Um, and therefore the risk is much more. At the moment, we are following the guidelines of the International Society of Ultrasound and Obs and Gynae. We are developing um, the fetal medicine guidelines also under uh, uh, Dr. Alpesh for India. But at the moment, we are following this. And the bottom line is that the protection that we use depends on the community prevalence. So for us who are in Delhi, I mean, I, I'm in a place where there's widespread community transmission. So it's important for me that not only do I wear scrubs and a respirator mask, I need to wear a, a, a fluid resistant gown, make sure I wear goggles. Uh, wear gloves and take all precautions. However, the states where perhaps they don't have so many COVID-19 patients, it's enough for us to wear masks and um, uh, masks and gloves and you know uh, dedicated gowns. We don't need to do as much. Um, the other thing are the antenatal scans. When patients come to us, it is important that we do a verbal screening because you can you can sit there and push the appointment back, uh, maybe by a week or two weeks, depending on her symptoms. It is important that when she comes in, she wears a, a mask. But the problem with scans is that because of the laws of our country, for instance, the MTP Act, which prohibits termination after 20 weeks, you have to make sure that the anomaly scan is done before 20 weeks. You, it is important that we screen for Down syndrome. So it has to be done between 11 to 14 weeks. And because babies can die if they are hypoxic, because there's an increased risk of stillbirths, if there is a growth restricted baby, if the Dopplers are abnormal, they need to to, they need to be um, uh, looked at in that way. So the reality, however, is that women are avoiding hospitals. They are missing routine scans. And increasingly, we are being presented with anomalies which are coming later and later. And then they are stuck because there's nothing much we can do. So really, I would encourage the obstetricians that whether we are in the COVID era or not, we must keep to timelines for antenatal scans because it really creates a lot of problems if we don't. Um, the third aspect is the vertical transmission, which is uh, Dr. Shanta also alluded to that. So at this moment in time, we don't have evidence that it goes through, that the blood-borne route um, is, is, is there. So because um, because again, placenta, fluid, membranes, cord blood, all of them, we have not been able to culture viruses. But if one looks at all these studies, it is literally maybe 50 cases or so, because there's just not enough information. The other problem is that it is all the vertical transmission studies have looked at third trimester infection. And there's been a very short time period between infection and delivery. We have absolutely no idea what happens if a woman's infected in the first trimester or the second trimester. Uh, of course, there's the cytokine storm, much like the gametes um, uh, having the ACE2 
uh, receptors. Similarly, the placenta has it too. So there is a possibility if we extrapolate from the other viral uh, studies that there would be an increased risk of miscarriage, of stillbirths, of preterm delivery, of growth restriction. But at the moment, we don't have enough data. What we can say is that there is a possibility of ascending infection through the vagina because uh, pregnant women may present with diarrhea. There's a lot of rectal shedding of the virus. And if there is a situation of a uh, prom, then unlike earlier times, it probably is more sensible to have her COVID tested and delivered or perhaps not to prolong a pregnancy if there's been a premature rupture of uh, membranes. Um, the last area that we are uh, involved with are the prenatal uh, diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. All the time, and this is um, a table from the IFMSS, which is a society which sort of gives us directions. Um, for sure, we believe that the benefit of any procedure we do is much, much higher than the theoretical risk of vertical transmission. So maybe a CBS procedure, if one does, if you can defer it for an amniocentesis, because in a CBS you're handling a placenta, whereas in an amniocentesis you're not, perhaps you can shift it. But any other procedure in fetal medicine tends to be an emergency. We don't have elective procedures. So the fetal blood transfusions, lasers, uh, selective feticides in monochorionic twin, because the benefit is so much higher, it is actually, uh, we, we, we would go ahead with it. So my take home points are, it, there is evolving knowledge, but at the moment we would say that there's a negligible risk of vertical transmission. We would suggest that we keep to routine antenatal scans. We would uh, entreat the obstetricians that COVID or no COVID, these patients need to be seen at the correct time for their scans and uh, intervention procedures are safe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anupam. Thank you, Dr. Anita Kaur, for that very informative talk. Um, now I would like to move on and I'll take the privilege to introduce our next esteemed speaker, um, that is Dr. Prakash Trivedi who is going to talk about assisted reproductive technology in COVID. Dr. Prakash Trivedi is Eurogyne and IVF consultant and is pioneer in 3D laparoscopic surgery. He has, uh, she has published 10 international level books on gynae advances and IVF. Dr. Prakash Trivedi is the president of Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction. Dr. Tirvadi is Vice President of Indian Association of Gynecological Endoscopies and Past President of Federation of Obstetric and Gynecological Societies of India. Please welcome Dr. Prakash Tirvadi. Dr. Tirvadi. Is he muted? Uh, Dr. Trivedi, do you want to come in? We can see your first slide, but it's kind of stuck there. He has to click on the side, on, on the slide. I got, I got stuck with the same problem. Just click right. on the slide. Yeah, there's some problem in that. Dr. Trivedi, do you want to click these? Dr. Trivedi, you're muted. Please unmute yourself. Maybe the host has to unmute him. No, he can unmute. He's a co-host. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you, Dr. Trivedi. Yeah, good. Sure. Um, at the outset, it's a great pleasure. And what I was trying to tell is, uh, we always say good evening, good morning, whatever it is. I think so. I always say good women's health, good women's health, good women's health. And I've been one of the odd person who is the president of Obstetric and Ionic Society, Endoscopy Society, and even IVF. I would first make a very honest confession that uh, during COVID, I've gone into COVID to almost do a PhD. 
and I have less fears than what most of the people talk. Uh, before I go into the subject, I'll just make a simple honest confession that barring three, four days of lockdown, I have nine cesarean sections done, eight normal deliveries done, three mid-trimester abortions done, eight first-trimester abortions done, few tablet abortions done, 12 to 14 laparoscopic surgeries done, all with extraordinary care because first two days I spent time with my staff, staff, anesthetists and everybody. And obviously IVF we started just recently. Uh, I promise that I will remain and stick to the time, uh, but I wanted to open up with a different note. Now, uh, we have to un understand few uh, the impact of COVID on infertility and ART practice. Nandita was stuck with the slides. I think so in COVID, as this virus is moving, anything can get stuck. But Problem is we are stuck in thought process. We are not understanding the, the primary issue. And that is what is really important. Persons who never cared a damn about history are truly responsible for repeating them. We are on the 100th year of a pandemic. And most of the time, we don't tend to learn anything from a pandemic. And this is the first time a pandemic is teaching us so much and I'm extremely proud and happy, Dr. Sibyl and everybody here uh, to have such a nice platform to interact. The reproduction is an essential human right, but COVID possesses such a great challenge and a threat. I'm also extremely happy that our president, Alpesh Gandhi, our incoming president, a little later, Shanta Kumari, our past president, Nandita, all have highlighted and or friends from abroad. Reproductive healthcare professionals are in, in special position has to provide advocacy. Like I have an institute wherein we used to start work at eight o'clock in the morning and finish at 12 o'clock in the night or later. So it has obstetrics, it has five sonography machine, endoscopy, 35,000 surgeries done so far, IVF more than 7,000. Now, what happens is there is something like you can't just put a halt and that there is something which we will have in the discussion time. Uh, we have to be concerned by advocating right and promote health and well-being of the patient. I always say I'm bothered about the female. That's why I went into COVID. I'm bothered about females' relatives. I'm bothered about female children. So I think so we have to go. So initially when... ART is the only thing which I started on 2nd of June. That was the only thing which I had kept on all which um, we all had made a policy decision. Only thing which was permitted was fertility preservation, oncology, cryopreservation. Most of the thing went into freezing, separate storage, high dilution and multiple washes to see that nothing is getting contaminated. The biggest problem is Infertility, though not a disease, affects 12% of the couple. And please remember, they are already under mental anxiety before COVID. Now, with COVID, they were more anxious. And if COVID is going to take time to go away, they are still more anxious. Now, if they're pregnant, they are also anxious. So basically, I think so we have to understand we obstetrician, gynecologists, infertility, endoscopy, urogynecologists are born to treat patients. I always tell, I joined the army not to tell that I will not go to the border. So point is very simple and clear is that with advancing age, infertility results also go down. So there are a lot of time wherein patient finds it very difficult to, that we go and convince, you know, some of them have frozen embryos and we have to counsel in a proper fashion. At no stage we have ignored any of the principles which anywhere in the world they will be following. So treatment should be given when they are treatable. Spread through sexual contact doesn't take place. Now, we always make a negative statement. It is not proven so far. That it is you know, vertically not. I would rather say a simple statement that sexual contact 
vertical transmission at this moment of time doesn't take place. When it when it is proven, we will see at that time. Oocyte, sperm, embryo, ACE receptors are protected by zona pellucida. There will be one or two papers who will come and tell, no, we found in the blastocyst, we found here and there. Let's not confuse people more. That's a medical research internal problem. That I think so we have to sort it out rather than tell to the patient, well, I'm not sure. And every time most of the patient says, you're the biggest doctor, greatest doctor, and you somebody comes to you and you say, no, I can't consult or I can't give you advice, and their problem is then they will go to whom? So we have to be very clear that COVID can affect women. Shantar told correctly, it's not that it's not going to affect COVID. COVID can affect anybody. But a good point about pregnancy and infertility is most of these women are in the younger age group and they have lesser chances of serious problems. In pregnancy, there can be some effects, especially on the child after the delivery. So tell them not to panic. If they're pregnant, counsel, see them as the fetal medicine person told rightly. See, sometimes I make it very simple. We do PV, we do TVS. I will do telemedicine as much as I want. How do I do a PV? How do I do a TVS? How do I do a follicular study? How do I check fetal arts out? So basically triaging and seeing minimum patient and doing COVID tests, what somebody told us correct, it is not available. I fought with our MLA local and got permission that we will do COVID test for those women who need services. We didn't tell emergency who need services because for somebody fibroids and excessive bleeding needs services and attention. You can't say I, I will not attend. Now we are successfully mitigating relatively. I will not say because uh, I just spoke to the same MLA uh, half an hour back and he's one of the MLA who is not typical politician. So with additional data, we advise resumption of reproductive activity because patients are really getting impatient. There's no debate about telemedicine. On every given day after the first four or five days of lockdown, Every given day, we see six patients in three hours or eight patients in four hours. With all the precaution, I have all the videos on how we do the laparoscopy, how we do the consulting. We don't entertain COVID positive patients. We are talking all this group of patients which we mentioned, they, the relative, etc., etc., all have been checked for COVID negative. All have gone and we have rechecked that there is no COVID in them or there is no, no symptoms. So reproductive health has to be continuously provided. And telemedicine and all, there is no debate about it. We have to be concerned about our staff also. At the same time, we have to find out way. Infertility, as I told you, it's not a disease. It's a public health issue. It's such a big issue. That reproductive medicine is essential, you know, from ages, you know, people have sold properties, people have so many things. So we have to understand any female patient or a couple who comes as your daughter or your son or your daughter-in-law, how you would have managed. And then your entire attitude will start changing and going into depths of COVID really makes you more stronger and more clear. Basically, we have to have good advocacy. We have to advocate to give them. We are meant to give them santona. You give them some peace of so physical and psychological well-being. You know, we are supposed to give them an idea. Please don't panic. Infectivity of coronavirus is high. But case fatality rate is not that high. Teach them how to reduce infection. Check the lo local prevalence rate. Available resources. As I told you, with so much of work we have done, the entire group of all those patients, their first relative, our staff, our house, everybody's checked for COVID swab prior and four weeks later. Implement proactive risk management, uh, uh, risk assessment. So if you have a person, as somebody was mentioning triage, our receptionists and all are triaging on telephone very nicely. The moment there is some indication that there is cough or probably this and all. And I have given advice to 25, 30 COVID people because I have addressed 24,000 consultants and patients on COVID matter. Prioritize your care. 
give probably to a person who is having poor ovarian reserve, advanced age, endometriosis. A young patient who has time, you can tell that probably you can wait for nine months or so. It is better for you. You need not, you need not tell because she may get pregnant in the next month and then, then they will be worried that now I have COVID. What to do? Counsel patients for deferring treatment. As I told you, patients who can wait, you tell them, please, uh, uh, you, you have enough time. Adhere to reduce the risk of vertical transmission. So if there is bleeding PV, if there's something else, this is an 8 micron non-living particulate material. It doesn't go do magic. It doesn't go inside the peritoneal cavity and aerosolize on itself. You know, there's a lot of lack of understanding on the spread and the mode of the disease spread. It goes into WBC, it, WBC becomes a macrophage, then it goes to the hypothalamus, then the temperature change. You don't expect Suddenly, it goes inside a peritoneal cavity without anything and it aerosolization. So, there are a lot of misconception, and we discussed that in endoscopy also. And uh, there are a lot of things and we have modified and invented systems whereby we can have safety. Adhere to reduction of vertical transmission, you can't promise. Because if you promise, you, you can't. Coding is very much necessary. And coding more than patients, it's more important for staff. Because in Italy, of 0.3% who were COVID positive, 14 to 15% were medicos, and 13% of them died. So we have to understand every person who were telling, you have to follow guidelines. You cannot have a shortcut, and you cannot be uh, politically foolish, wherein you can it because I have good habits. Remain updated about new medical finding. You should know almost weekly changes with respect to COVID which is happening in your area or in your country or even the world. Planning, you have to develop and refine robust emergency plan. Because as Shanta pointed out, if somebody is going to come in shock and all, you, you are really stuck. You be clear concerned that your treatment may be interrupted irrespective of the fact that whatever we had started, but we may... Most important thing during this time and this pandemic, we have to re and first try and go into details and details. And I would request all the panel people here and anybody to just write an email. I can send you so much of material about clear knowledge about COVID so that you get an idea. Because reproductive medicine data is available. COVID research is necessary. Screening, monitoring, prevalence, impact on patient progeny. Then gametes, mothers, neonet, ready QRs. You also give an idea about a country. Somebody mentioned about hydroxy HCQ. There's a big controversy about it. I'll not go into detail of that controversy. But you have to have a research registry, and I'm very proud that Fox is having a lot of other organizations in America, Australia, UK, and you name every place they're having. But most important concluding remarks are only two. Lessons learned from this experience is to deal first with this situation and then the future pandemic. Lots of doctors are more confused than managing. Finally, you have to remember that when anybody is on the deathbed, nobody repents, oh, I could have worked more, I could have earned more. Everybody only repents that they could have spent more time with the family, more time with friends, more time with the loved ones. And we have to understand now in, during lockdown, you have time wherein you do work till 3, 4 o'clock. You have all the time to be with your family. You have Skype meeting and a lot of discussions you can take place. Uh, I would like to summarize by saying, let's all understand COVID and let's all treat women. Because if we will not treat women, who will treat? But let's treat it safely for us and also safely for the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Seema. And thank you very much, Dr. Shanta, Anita, and uh, Prakash. Uh, we move on to the next set of talks. And it's a privilege to uh, invite Dr. Raju. Dr. B.K. Raju is a very eminent ophthalmologist who practices in West Virginia. He's the president and founder of, of the Eye Foundation of America and the founder president of Gautami Eye Institute in India. Very well known for the voluntary work that he does in many parts of the world. He's the director of the International Ocular Surface Society 
and member of the executive committee of Kapio. Over to Dr. V. K. Rancho. So, who is the first one I'm introducing? Dr. Dr. Hethel Gore is the first speaker for you. I'm very glad to be here today. And I would just wait a half a minute to say the first, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, the first antiviral agent to medicine was introduced through ophthalmology, 5-iodo-2-deoxyuridine in 1916. It came as an ophthalmic drug because an anti-cancer drug, it was too toxic. So ophthalmology could use it as a topical agent. I just wanted to say it is not a very well-known fact at all. It came through ophthalmology. Well, Dr. Hilton. Sorry. Is an echo, Dr. Raju, from your system. Let's try again. Can I go on? Yeah. Dr. Heto Gore is a board certified of OBG when what's happening on anything on my side or what? It seems to be your side, Dr. Raju. Because everybody is muted. So what? Try again. I unmuted. How is that now? Yeah. Good. Dr. Hector Gore is a board certified OBGYN and practicing in Englewood, New Jersey. Dr. Gore is the recipient of multiple awards such as Top Doctor, Top 10 Gynae Surgeon Award, Compassionate Doctor Award, Patient Patient's Choice Award, International Women's Award, International Academy Award 9, 2017, Rising Star Award, and Nari Ujjami Award 2018, and many others. Dr. Gore sits on the board of New Jersey Statewide Advisory Commission on Minority and Multicultural Health. Dr. Gore is the founder president of U.S. chapter of F4GSI, and Dr. Gore is all yours. Hello, everybody. I would um, like to thank Api, Gapio, and Foxy for giving us this opportunity. Um, can everybody see me? Yeah, see and hear very well. Thank you. Okay. So, um, this is a great platform to get all of us from different parts of the continent. And um, what my talk is, is different because certain parts are still in the pre-COVID era, some are in COVID crisis and some are in post-COVID crisis. So a lot of the talk, you have to adjust it depending upon where you are and what your country's um, and your state guidelines are. So talking about um, COVID and um, elective surgery and emergency surgery, that's my topic. And I'm going to get the slides going. So elective surgeries, right? While planning an elective gynecological surgery, consideration of patients population as well as available resources your state guidelines your country's guidelines are very very important reason being uh, different countries and different states have made uh, different guidelines so for example in the united states we had um paused a lot of um elective surgeries while covid crisis was happening so that's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Number two, modification of approach is very appropriate, right? When the risk of exposure to COVID-19 is elevated and healthcare resources for outpatient care are reduced. So depending upon what you have, uh, your PPE supplies, how many number of beds are available in ICU, 
or how many beds are available in the hospital, all that is going to guide your um, elective surgery and how do you plan it. Now, elective surgery is scheduled depending upon the patient's severity of symptoms. Are they bleeding very heavily? Are they in a lot of pain? Is the fibroids growing or, or there's a, a concern for gynecological uh, cancers, those are the symptoms that's you know going to kind of guide you. How you're going to treat these people. Also, what is effect on the quality of life of a patient? That's going to guide you how you kind of uh, treat and use your resources, as well as potential consequences if you are not treating these people. So that's how um, elective surgery is being planned and implemented. We have um, approached what's called universal screening of any patient undergoing elective surgery, not in GYN, in, in all specialties, especially orthopedics, neurology, and um, general surgery. And we uh, tend to do 48 hours or 24 hours before the planned surgery to do a nasal swab and screen everybody universally for COVID um, virus. If um, they are found to be positive, then we try to postpone the surgery till the nasal swabs are negative. Um, that way we reduce the exposure to healthcare personnel as well as um, the operating room um, instruments and especially the ducts, um, et cetera. Now, universal precautions that we have discussed so far, especially use of um, you know, the N95 and on top uh, surgical mask, um, face shields, um, goggles, um, water um, and fluid resistant gowns, special gowns uh, we have for anesthesia team, et cetera, that should be used for the people in um, the operating room. What's the guidelines as far as um, how, how much amount of OR time is allowed? We don't have in the United States any guidelines as to how much time should be in the OR, but try to minimize your OR time, limit the number of um, uh, visitors as well as um, any non-emergent person that is not needed. For example, you don't need to have a vendor in the room. You don't want to have um, a student uh, in the room. So that's kind of what um, we are looking at here. Um, as far as um, hospital, how are they getting ready for it? So um, there are hospitals which have made prioritization uh, by having a committee. That committee is deciding which uh, patient gets the priority. Now, um, it can have uh, the specialty person, um, maybe a hospital administrator, an OR nurse or a head nurse, as well as anesthesia. Um, so that's kind of basic team that kind of decides. Um, so those decision-making bodies are making plans. Sustained reduction in COVID-19 admissions. That's one of the key factor. When you are trying to get elective surgeries going, there has to be a trend. There is a reduction in number of COVID-19 admissions. Making sure there is enough beds available um, for COVID patients and as well as um, other emergency which can be non-COVID. Sufficient number of ICU beds, ventilators, PPE, and staff should be available ability to provide staff and patient COVID testing. That's really important because if you have a patient who is COVID positive and you are exposing your healthcare workers in the operating room, there has to be ability to treat and test these people. Um, there has to be a clearly demarcated COVID positive OR rooms and COVID negative OR rooms. And that way, um, even if thorough cleaning is done, you're reducing the risk of exposure to non-COVID patients who came for emergency or elective treatments getting exposed to this, a designated PACU, which is no longer in use for COVID ICU, and ability to transfer the surgical cases within the system, optimizing the utilization um, of um, the OR capacity, um, anesthesia, and other resources. Ambulatory utilization uh, of surgery, right? So either um, same-day surgeries, um, making sure certain surgeries which can be done as an outpatient is really, really what we are asking people to implement it rather than bring them as um, either same day in the hospital, if not done outpatient, or do it them as um, same day rather than having it as an inpatient. Mm -hmm. Coordination with ambulatory service for pre-op and post-op care, maintaining the Physical distancing is very important. Um, that way we are kind of uh, limiting the face-to-face -face time with um, 
with the personnel. Now, anesthesia consideration is very important. So you are in constant contact with your anesthesia team. Uh, we are making sure that surgical team leaves the operating room while intubation is happening. And there is a predetermined time between the surgeon and anesthesia team that is decided before they re-enter the room. So usually it's around 20 minutes by the time the anesthesiologist um, gives the pre-medications, intubates it, stabilizes the tube, etc. And in 20 minutes, the, the operating team comes back in the room and starts with scrubbing and, and uh, preparing the patient. Confirm that anesthesia supplies in the room, especially scopes and medication is in the room. We are limiting the number of people moving in and out of the operating room. Um, somebody said they can't hear me. Can everybody hear me? All right. Thank you, Ravi. Um, so but try to minimize the number of people going in and out of the operating room, which is very um, important. So um, that's what we are planning um, in case of um, anesthesia consideration. They have anesthesia tents also available for high-risk patients, um, and I'll come when we are talking about emergency surgeries. Um, use of HEPA filters times two for the patient as well as anesthesia machines. Crash carts should be fully stocked with medication available also. So that's one of the other um, important points. So make sure your anesthesia team is also um, on board. Intra-op, right, assess the need for um, any revisions of your time-off procedures. Uh, make sure that that is done uh, before you are exposing to the viral load. So you would make sure the time of procedure is done before um, the intubation. So kind of you have to change your in OR procedures. Uh, guidelines for who's present discussed already. Um, consider including uh, only the minimum number of persons. So usually one surgical tech, one circulating anesthesiologist, surgeon, and the co-surgeons are the minimum number of people that we are allowing. And um, guidelines of the PPE use, we are uh, training everybody who is coming um, for any surgical um, part of the team, um, proper use of PPE, proper use, and taking it out and discarding it in a safe manner. Um, that's also very essential things. Um, and reviewing the specimen pickup uh, procedure, right? Um, how are we going to transfer uh, if there's a frozen section or um, if it's not urgently needed, you'll keep the specimen in the room and how are you going to transport those things? So you have to um, quickly work with your team um, and make a planning um, according to um, the availability that you have. In case of emergency gynecological surgery, so um, to name some few uh, ectopic miscarriages, dysfunctional uterine bleeding with heavy active bleeding, tubo ovarian abscesses, these are some gynecological emergencies which require immediate attention. Now, at this point, you might not have time to do COVID testing for everybody. You would ask the symptoms. You're going to ask for exposures. You're going to do the temperature. Um, if there is a rapid uh, COVID testing available, there's some places the turnaround time is 20 minutes. Some place um, has a four hours and some places we might not have it. Then you're going to assume somebody as being positive and try to do everything possible to reduce the risk to the healthcare professional as well as the surrounding members as well as operating room. Um, so if those um, rapid testing are, are not available, you're going to use universal precautions, proper use of PPE. Uh, most ORs and, and some of the emergency room um, beds um, are now made into what we call as negative pressure rooms. So there has been a lot of um, changes on how we manage the air inside the operating room. And we are going to um, change that. Um, so that's um, the negative pressure um, rooms. Now, through um, thorough cleaning of the operating room is very important, right? You want to make sure the rooms are cleansed properly. Um, and after the, each case, there is a thorough cleaning of op all the operating rooms. And then we are using UV lights. There are special UV lights that we have that um, they close the OR um, 
for a certain number of hours and making sure the UV light will destroy any, especially we are worried for the, uh, the central heating and central AC and the air supplies because it can stay in those lights, etc. So all those thorough cleaning with UV lights is what um, most hospital is doing it. Now, um, abortion, right? Abortion has a very special place. It's neither an emergency, neither it's elective. So the time is of essence and hence um, make sure that it becomes a priority. Now, most people, we are trying to do a, a telemed um, visit for um, elective. I think some people are saying they don't hear, um, but I see that people are, so I'm not sure. Can everybody hear? But we can we can hear you, Hazel, but I just also wanted to remind you about the time. Yes, I'm you. almost done. It's I'm almost drop. done. Yeah. So the time is of essence and priority. So we're trying to do a telemed consultation with these people who are um, for um, elective termination. And uh, we do a pre- and post-op telemed visits. Um, as per um, American College of OBGYN, there is no need for a pre-procedure ultrasound and telemed post-op visits can be done. Medical terminations are preferred over uh, surgical terminations. So um, with that, I conclude the talk and I'm pretty sure if there are questions, we'll do the Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you and over to Dr. Raju. Uh, next one, uh, who was the one? Uh, You're Kamal? supposed to introduce Dr. Kavita Bapad. Yeah. Well, um, uh, we have a privilege to introduce uh, Kavita Bapad. She's an OBGYN and fertility specialist. Kavita, Dr. Kavita specializes in minimal invasive surgery and advanced gynecological procedures and has done more than 5,000 hysterectomies during the last 15 years. Dr. Kavita is Vice President-Elect of the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India 2021. Dr. Kavita is all yours. Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Raju. First of all, I thank Dr. Anupam Sibbal and Dr. E. Kittenden for including me into this. And special thanks to my own Foxy people, especially Dr. Nandita Palshitkar, Dr. Shanta Kumari, and Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, and President Isar, Dr. Prakash Trivedi. Thank you so much for including me into the women's health. Now, the contraception and MTP is a great topic. And with COVID and all these things, we are finding it out with the lockdown, the people are going to produce many more. So India is going to see population explosion soon in next nine months. So it's a very, very important topic, what I feel about. Now, the why to discuss this into the pandemics, again, I am saying sexual activity does not cease even with the ongoing COVID pandemic. Seeing the OPD, it seems it's rather increased. The contraception and the family planning information and the services need a vast advertisement as they are, prevent unintended pregnancies and avoid unsafe uh, abortions. Now, what our role as a gynecologist, we are supposed to, supposed to, help the patients to identify the symptoms of COVID, make them understand the self-isolation if required, detailed discussions of available methods of contraception, explaining the risk of planning pregnancy now, and what precautions to take if already pregnant, various MTP methods available to be informed. Now the important thing is telemedicine, is everybody is discussing about the telemedicine, it's a boon or headache, Sometimes it becomes headache when the patient calls us, condom got ruptured, missed my periods, itching all over private parts, etc., etc. But the problem is not that simple. If we have, it has got a boon, as Nandita Palshitkar has rightly said. Now, this is the future, and we should have the telemedicine in this. This is the future and a boon for the patient for sure. Now, how we can counsel a patient? for this, for the uh, contraception. Now, how will they, they get the contraceptive services regarding the delay injectables, how they will get the IUD renewals, when and how much to wait, when to go for the facing problems, through discussions to clear any risk if possible, provide psychological relief to the patient. This, this counseling is very, very important. And telehealth contraception, again, provide high quality counseling, contraceptive methods. These are three things. Number one is the contraception counseling, provide telehealth patients centered counseling on the age 
of methods and patient priorities number 2 is contraception initiation it's tough in the time of covid to initiate any contraception still we can ask they can come and they can start for it avoid delay by sending prescriptions to the pharmacy mailing or pre packing to pick up from any providers and third is most important is assess risk of the pregnancy we should know what is the risk of the pregnancy during this so need in person visit for the iud implant sterilization or for the injected contraception so delay in visit of covid symptoms pending test results and asymptomatic concept so initiate the bridging method as needed and the these are the directions the service provider and the policy maker should do it should increase the use of mobile phones and a digital technologies and there should be many more apps to communicate with the patient to increase telephonic counseling relate to safe and effective use of contraceptive regular uh, telephonic follow ups these are very very important mean we should do and the last what we expect from the government which i shouldn't say it but it's very very important for the population control that we should be worried about all this part that ensure supply of the contraceptive methods to make availability of the contraceptive door to door and nearest possible supportive supervision of the service providers ensure availability of the commodities and develop and disseminate the message through advertisements a simple language through social media radio tv talks and show etc so in a covid time we can prevent unnecessary pregnancies we can prevent we can have a safe abortions and a good contraceptive advice to the people and i'm really thank you so much for involving me but our role is to advocate to check to implement and to prioritize counsel and adhere to the things thank you so much thank you kavita ji for for sticking to time really appreciate that and over to dr raju yeah thank you this was wonderful you know men uh, is it a headache or uh, we were useful this um, telemedicine it's like all Alfred Nobel invited dynamite for peace that's what he wrote in his essay but it was for peaceful purposes or what we are doing with the dynamite anyway next i have a privilege to introduce dr geeta norgand professor geeta norgand is the lead consultant for reproductive medicine at st george's hospital london and founder and medical director of create fertility and abc of ivf that must be in vitro fertilization uk she has published extensively in the field of natural and mild ivf and advanced ultrasound technology in reproductive reproductive medicine professor geeta is president of the international society for mild approaches in assisted reproduction she has served on committees for nih NHS England and World Health Organization Professor Geeta is an elected trustee on the board of British Red Cross and has previously served as its London vice president Professor Geeta is also a director and a trustee on the board of London Emergency Trust all yours madam thank you very much indeed for that very kind and generous introduction Uh, I would like to thank the organizers and Gapio, and particularly in the UK, Dr. Ramesh Mehta, for um, giving me this opportunity. And I have absolutely enjoyed um, this session this afternoon. It's been um, quite um, interesting and helpful. Um, and I have to say, I mean, we I have had two colleagues um, from India who have contributed to the field of um, IVF um, in the last few minutes. Nandita and Dr. Trivedi, um, and I was quite fortunate to be able to contribute to the UK government's decision during COVID-19 as regards to reopening of the IVF sector, and we have learned a lot. But my talk now, in the next few minutes, is really a focused one, which is based on our own work. So I published uh, several articles during the lockdown, and one in the BMJ um, about. how can we make women's health a priority in ivf during and post um covid crisis and the aim of this is really to concentrate on how do we how do we stop hospital admissions for women undergoing ivf that is the main focus of my talk in the next few minutes 
So this is based on the article I wrote in the British Medical Journal in May this year. So it's quite important. I mean, Nandita and Dr. Trivedi have extensively gone through as to how we can provide the assisted reproduction treatment um, for women needing this treatment during this crisis. So I won't go into that because the guidelines are fairly established all over the world today, and we are all following those guidelines not only protect our, to protect our patients, but also to protect our staff and the wider public. But what is quite important for us, who are the RT practitioners, is to reduce complications and to ensure that we prevent hospital admissions during this crisis and also post this crisis. So the, it's a very focused talk, and so I'm not sure how useful this is going to be for our colleagues who are not practicing the assisted conception. But the two main reasons why women can get admitted following ART would be ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and bleeding and infection following the procedures, and particularly so the collection procedure in IVF. So I'm just going to show you the work we have done and published in this area. The first one is to make sure we employ mild stimulation protocol. And I will later on to my colleagues show an editorial I've just written along with Professor Fauser from the Netherlands in the major scientific journal Reproductive Biomedicine Online, which is just published, why this is so important that we actually concentrate on this, not only during this crisis, but also post-crisis, because it's not only about safety and health, but also affordability, because there's no doubt they're all going to go into an economic recession and therefore making IVF affordable and accessible to all is also as important as protecting safety. So if we employ mild stimulation protocols, then we can achieve both. And we can identify risk factors for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and we can use targeted advanced ultrasound to ensure that we avoid and reduce ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in potential hospital admissions, and to be alert at all times. So I just show this image here because this is the work we have published about how we can identify particularly those at risk using Doppler as well because of the increased stromal flow contributing particularly to the message about ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because of increased VGF levels. And that is something we can predict and identify these women in order to prevent ovarian have stimulation syndrome. This is the other thing we have mentioned in our DMJ article, because if we aim to collect a higher number of eggs, then quite clearly there is going to be an increased vascularity in ovaries, and then increased vascular endothelial growth factor, which will both contribute to potential bleeding at egg collection and also infection. So if we address those along with the experience of surgeon during these procedures, we are very likely to prevent complications and hospital admissions, which is very much needed during this time. It's needed all the time, but more so during the crisis and post-crisis. And I just, I don't think I'll go into these two slides, but these are our latest publications, scientific publications, once again, showing how mild stimulation is not only equally effective to conventional stimulation, but it can also significantly reduce complications and treatment costs, which are both required going forward. And this is in poor responders, and this is um, a paper that we have submitted as regards to all, set, all categories of women. So I suppose what I would like to say is, um, if you have access to reproductive biomedicine online, or if anybody is interested, we wrote um, an editorial which is just published as to how we should move forward after COVID crisis to help women in IVF and also the couples in IVF and how can we make this more affordable and safer for women. And I think at this point, if I could also point out that gender-based medicine um, has been around for more than a decade and I have particularly shown an interest around 12 years ago and participated in this forum. And I recently noticed that the NIH in the US started a forum on gender-based medicine, which is going to be increasingly important in the future when it comes to human health. And I think if we could 
and you could, as GAPIO and other national organizations, could contribute to this. But I think we will be protecting women's health going forward. And I would like to once again thank you for the opportunity. And I'm really enjoying this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita, and thank you so much, Dr. Raju. Uh, we now uh, move on to the next two sessions, and it's going to be uh, a privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Rohini Sridhar, colleague, uh, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Apollo Hospital Madurai Region. Um, Rohini is the Joint Secretary of GAPIO and is a core member of the group of GAPIO Women's Forum. Over to you, Rohini. Thank you, Dr. Rani. In this talk, so far, we had a rather comprehensive coverage of every aspect of obstetric care, and we now move to the pediatric perspective. I'm happy to invite Dr. VP Goswami to speak on managing the nursery in COVID 19 times. Dr. VP Goswami is a senior consultant pediatrics at the government MGM Medical College at Indore. And Indore, as many of you who were following it would know, was one of the earliest cities to have a sharp spike of COVID. Uh, and I think they have managed it rather well in the last few days. Dr. VP Goswami has published 30 national and international papers and edited two books in pediatrics. He's the immediate past president of the National Neonatology Forum of India and is the master trainer of many governmental, IAP, and NNF skill-based trainings. Over to Dr. Goswami. Dr. Goswami, are you there? Yeah, he was. Uh, VP, do you want to come in? Dr. Goswami? Dr. Goswami. Dr. Goswami, can you come in? Uh, yes. Dr. Goswami, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. I'm here. Please go ahead. You're Slides are being moved, so just say next and uh, Simran will move your slides. Simran, move to the next one, please. Is there? Yeah, am I audible to you? Yes. Perfectly, please go ahead. Hello? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. So, uh, good evening, friends. Hello, am I um, audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, good evening, friends. At the outset, I must thank uh, Dr. Anupam and uh, his team, as well as Dr. Tandon. And uh, I congratulate all the previous speakers and thanks the participants. Friends, uh, while uh, saluting my alma mater, uh, I'm going to present, uh, you know, managing nursery, which itself is a complex issue. And uh, my presentation is basically based on WHO, UNICEF, IAP, ICMR, and NNF guidelines so as you know that uh, you know it's a an emerging infection and um, uh, so many guidelines and so many protocols they keeps on changing so uh, friends uh, uh, as you know next slide please as you know that the individual has right to survive so neonate also needs to survive and thrive properly irrespective of any situation whether it is a covid positive situation so we know that COVID-19 pandemic is, uh, you know, globally and very emergent situation. And it's a challenging one because, uh, you know, so many things depends on the single unit that is women and child. So before birth of the neonate, uh, you know, it is a single unit and after then it is separated. Uh, you know that we can postpone so many elective and other medical conditions, but childbirth cannot be. Therefore, it need, it requires so many SOPs and special arrangement uh, in SNCU, uh, especially when it comes to a COVID positive mother. So the core area which I am going to discuss is the status of mother and neonate. Uh, most of you know about that. What are the criteria of positive or negative? I am going to discuss a bit about. You know, it's very lengthy, but uh, I have decided the core points to be there. 
so the another one is resuscitation in covid 19 feeding up newborn care up newborn infection control practices in the nicu and visitors policy as well as discharge criteria i am going to discuss so most of you already know the status of mother and neonate when we see say them uh, you know suspected and covid confirmed cases so you already know the criteria i am not going into detail of it so this you know next slide please so next is delivery room management so this is very complex you know pictorial uh, uh, chart and uh, i am going to summarize that it is a team work basically and the team consists of obstetrician neonatologist nursing officer as well as in few cases we might need anesthetist so you know in ideal situation covid labor room or special labor room for the covid people uh, are special you know covid dedicated wards are required and essence you uh, should be having a separate isolation um for resuscitation uh, as well as for transport policy also there should be a different policy so if we are not having the separate uh, you know isolation then at least you know we should keep away uh, the resuscitation trolley or the uh, you know uh, birth station 2 uh, meters away from the mother so next next please so when we come to the stable neonate a positive mother this uh, diagram or this photograph they uh, depict that the mother and baby should have a separate isolation room and i said that in the resource constraint setting we can have a 2 meter distance this trolley healthcare worker should wear the full pp in case of covid positive mother and we can allow even you know for the care uh, um, a healthy attender and we can keep a distance of 2 meter uh, you know separation should be 2 meter next so the requirement of the isolation wards are that the isolation ward should be adequately ventilated and it should have negative pressure adequate supply of ppe should be ensured separate trained staff should be there for the isolation you know the the team in the labor room and nicu or snc should be separate one and if the air conditioning is required then it should not be central air conditioning uh, and uh, you know possibly we should have the exhaust also so the next is resuscitation um, in covid situation please uh, change the slide uh, so the things to remember that uh, we should resuscitate a baby as per nrp protocol while taking few precautions like uh, in a closed circuit resuscitation is required for the covid positive mother uh, and you know baby also and uh, the situation or uh, resuscitation is as per nrp protocol but laryngeal web uh, airway instead of uh, uh, you know uh, ett we can use and hepa filter because there are so many uh, you know aerosol generating um, uh, situation is there endotracheal administration of drugs should be avoided preferably next slide please now coming to the infection control practices um, we should ensure 100% hand hygiene practices and gadget should be restricted especially uh, you know phone laptop and all this thing social distancing at least 1 meter and separate designated area as i said should be there and restricted entry of attendant should be there if there is a positive covid patient and the separate designation area most of the hospital they have the separate uh, dedicated counseling area also so that should be there so continuing the next slide continuing the disinfection in nicu uh, one should wear the ppe before the disinfecting the uh, you know snco floor chair table door handles telephone and all the object they should be disinfected with the 0.5% sodium chloride stethoscope bp cuff thermometer and all this you know small items uh, they can be uh, disinfected to 70% uh, alcohol after every use and the routine biomedical practices should be followed next so next table is uh, you know very much condensed so i am going to highlight only few points that uh, we should be uh, using uh, pp rationally and uh, there is a criteria and table for using essence uh, you know uh, pp in the essence so the saline paint are snu snu dealing with non covid cases or non critical cases 
uh, the triple layer mask and let us close, they are suffice. But if mother come from the contaminated area, then we should use the N95 mask. If labor room and OT for resuscitation, uh, triple layer mask, face shield, lattice glow, goggle, all should be used. And especially the critical SNCU, we should use full PPE from head to toe, like cape, goggle, N95 mask, uh, you know, PPE, entire kit, shoe, uh, shoe cover, and all these things should be weared properly. So next, about the uh, visitor's policy, you know, COVID positive may also allowed in the SNCU, but there are certain criteria like uh, uh, the fever of them should be resolved uh, without, anti without antipyretic for 72 hours at least, improvement in the respiratory symptoms and negative COVID test in the severe cases. These, you know, attenders can also be uh, enter in the SNCU if they fulfill all these criteria. Next. so. Uh, you know, there is a discharge policy also. So to summarize it, you know, uh, without using the flow chart, if the mother is negative, we discharge the baby as per discharge protocol and uh, according to the weight of the baby. Say, for example, less than uh, 2 kg or more than 2 kg, there are different criteria. If the mother is positive and neonate is asymptomatic, our symptoms are mild to moderate, then also we can discharge the baby. But the baby should be off oxygen for three days and stable on admission. And there is no need for the test. You know, RT, PCR test is not required such babies. If the symptoms are severe in the baby or neonate, then uh, we should uh, let it uh, the baby stable and, uh, um, you know, uh, make it asymptomatic. Then we should conduct the um, RT, PCR test or COVID test. So there are two scenarios where we can, uh, you know, conduct or not conduct the uh, COVID test. So the standard discharge criteria already, you know, most of the neonate and uh, nursing officers, they know the discharge criteria. So I'm not going into detail of the discharge criteria. They are same as, uh, you know, normal neonate. So thanks a lot, friend. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Goswami. That was a very informative talk. I now would like to invite Dr. Shailja Chaturvedi. Someone is not audible. Can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Goswami, thank you very much for your talk. And if there are any questions, we can take them up during Q&A. Thanks, Roini. I'd uh, like to now invite Dr. Shailija Chaturvedi to speak on mental health in women during COVID-19 times. Dr. Shailija works as a consultant uh, psychiatrist in Sydney, Australia. She's the past president of the Australian Indian Medical Graduate Association. She's currently the executive committee member of GAPIO and is also the member of the core group of GAPIO Women's Forum. And in both these capacities, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with her. Over to Dr. Shailija. Thank you very much, Dr. Shridhar. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everybody. It is about 1.30 in Sydney. And uh, I, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Anupam Sibal, Dr. Tandon, for organizing such a wonderful meeting. Can everybody hear me? Yes. We can okay. hear you. Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, women, they are more prone for psychological uh, uh, and very severe consequences of post-COVID. And the impact of the pandemic viral spread is going to be realized much after the pandemic has stopped. So we are starting to see the consequences and I think it is going to continue well after it has been controlled. So I'm going to be very quick because it's only five minutes I've given. Uh, the, the, what people, what women can complain uh, uh, in, in due, on account of the COVID is irritability, counter irritability, which means that people who are uh, living with them, they can also become very uh, irritable. So these, these are going to be quite significant symptoms, irritability and counter-irritability. Then, 
Depression, depression, as you can imagine, that there are so many restrictions placed and depression is going to be a very significant complaint. Stress, women are exposed to more stress and anxiety because they, their workload is increased. They have to look after the family. If they are working, then there are stresses at work. Emotional exhaustion, because the family demand are increased, so they are going to be emotionally exhausted because of their own needs and because of the needs of the family. In Australia, uh, the drug and alcohol use uh, has been reported to be increasing far more. I don't know about India because in India, women don't drink alcohol as much. But in uh, Australia, the use of drugs, illicit drugs, and of course, the prescribed drugs as well, and alcohol has increased. The one thing which has really been very extremely important is that uh, uh, that uh, domestic violence. Domestic violence has been a very, very big issue. And uh, uh, I think that is something which has been reported in India as well as overseas. And uh, in... Uh, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, they have reported that there were 23% increase in domestic violence. If, you, if a woman is living with a violent partner, that can increase to 23%, that, which is a very significant increase. And of course, as I said, increased alcohol and medication use. UN Population Fund, they have said that for every three months of lockdown, there are going to be 15 million cases of domestic violence, and I think worldwide. And I think that is a very concerning thing, that lockdown is causing increasing numbers of domestic violence, which can result in uh, much of the violence, suicide, and homicide as well. In India, as I read, that uh, there has been two-fold increase in domestic violence because people are living in a limited space and uh, they are getting frustrated and they take their anger out on each other. What are the risk factors? The risk factors are uh, loss of employment. Uh, I'll take the, can you see the slide? Yes, loss of employment, financial restraint, because in, in Australia, there is a, a government scheme that people who are um, falling to unemployment uh, during the COVID period, they are going to be supplemented by government and the government is giving very generous allowances to people who are affected by their employment difficulties. But I don't know about other parts of the world. So loss of employment is going to be a very big risk factor. And that, of course, will result in financial restraints. Another risk factor will be loneliness. People who are lonely and they are restricted in a limited space, confinement, uh, and people who have low self-esteem, I think these things are going to uh, uh, precipitate more depression, more anxiety, and more stress. Loss of boundaries, which means the people are living uh, within the same household and there is no uh, opportunity for time out and for privacy and everybody is scuttled in the same place. So I think loss of boundaries that, yes, my room has been invaded by so many other people and I think that is going to be um, a significant stress. Family or marital conflict. Uh, if they are pre-existing family or marital conflict, they are going to be accentuated. Uh, or otherwise, also, I think with the homeschooling, which has been in Australia, homeschooling and people staying at home, that can also cause the family and marital conflict. Increased workload, especially for women, because women are the managers of the home. So they work at um, wherever they work, there are increased pressures there, there are increased demand and there are increased uh, restrictions as well as uh, requirement for, uh, for example, social distancing and other restrictions. I think all these things are increasing the workload of women. Conditions at work, and if women are still working, if they are uh, either working from home or uh, uh, from uh, their workplace, 
uh, there can be a lot of changes because some people are not turning up to work and other people are very suspicious about being positive or negative. And there are many issues which can uh, recur at workplace. Lack of activity, naturally, if uh, women are uh, so stressed with the number of tasks they have to do, the activity is lower and also uh, because of the space uh, restrictions, the activity is uh, lowered, they don't exercise, they gain excessive weight and uh, they eat, they're eating excessively because they are home and they are uh, feeling stressed and anxious, they eat more. So they are going to put on waste. This is, I think it's going to be a significant risk for uh, uh, women in um, uh, after COVID and during the COVID. Now, what can we do to prevent it? We can do, uh, we can maintain routine. We can have time management, exercise, eat and sleep well. And as much as possible, if we can keep a discipline each day, I think we are going to do better. We keep in mind, uh, we keep our mind active reading or lots of things which you have been planning for years and years and uh, uh, you have not been able to accomplish. I think this is the time when you can do it. Set achievable goals. Again, you have to see what your priorities are, what are the things you would like to do because you have time in your hand and you can achieve your goal. If possible, go out as much as possible, uh, even if it is just outside your door and connect with people. These, these days there are many things which can help you to connect with people like we are doing it now, telephone and other things. And uh, so I wish you all of you the very best of luck to remain active and remain healthy and safe. Thank you very much. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaja. And thank you so much, Rohini. And we now move to the Q&A. And uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Bhupinder Sandhu, a very eminent pediatric gastroenterologist who established pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition at Bristol Royal Hospital for Children. She's been the past president of the Commonwealth Association of Pediatric Gastroenterology, uh, Hepatology and Nutrition. Uh, she has been recognized with an OBE uh, from the Queen. Uh, she is an executive committee member of GAPIO and is a member of the core group of the GAPIO Women's Forum. Um, the other moderator for the Q&A is Dr. Anju Agarwal, uh, who practices as a GP in Australia. She's past secretary and past vice president of the Australian Indian Medical Graduates Association. Uh, Anju uh, is a member of the President's Council of GAPIO and is a member of the core group of the GAPIO Women's Forum. So over to uh, Bhupinder and Anju. Hello. Um, thank you, Anupam. And hello, everyone. Uh, there are many interesting questions, so I will start with a couple of questions regarding contraception. Uh, so maybe questions for uh, question one is, have you seen increased request for termination of pregnancy during uh, COVID due to COVID fever, uh, COVID fear, and how do you cancel them? The second question which is related is, uh, what is the advocacy of family planning uh, on a mass scale in India. Thank you. Uh, maybe anyone else can take the answers? Okay. I think I can take that for the family planning services and all. I'm okay. Kavita is there or gone? Chanda? Kavita. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Let okay. Shanta Madhi. Let yes. Shanta Madhi. No, no, Kavita, you can take it then. Okay. See, the, the, the second question of yours being the family planning services, uh, how it has been uh, in the COVID era. There was a study actually in India where they, we have actually found out that during this lockdown and all, there was uh, about almost 60 to 70 percent uh, uh, the services were affected, be it especially the, uh, the contraception and family planning services. So there was a study which did prove that unfortunately women's health did suffer because of this uh, uncertainty in the OPD practices and all. And at any given point of time, the, the women couldn't actually reach out to the hospitals and the healthcare providers. So this has been an observation not only by Foxy, but even FIGO. 
being in the figo committee the study has shown very clearly all over the globe it has been affected sure yeah thank you shanta yes kavita it's not only it's only affected as well as uh, the reach to the people is not that much as it should be and it's definitely going to trouble our country for the population explosion so i think now it's a high time for everyone to look after into this matter into the contraception and the um, termination services to all i think that's why even the foxy and figo we have actually been working on this how to improve these services across the globe I mean, you need not focus it only to india or any other country because across the globe all the countries are all the women are facing the same problem so i think we have to brain, we are in the process of brainstorming and trying to see how best we can give better care especially in this sexual and reproductive medicine dr agarwal can i add a point uh, yes sir uh, see uh, more than 30 years of practice with endoscopy ivf and so many things normally in a year i used to have either one or two abortion or maybe very rarely one mid trimester abortion in last 3 months i was surprised that we had eight first trimester abortion three additional with was more with medical and incidentally one spina bifida one uh, uh, hemivertebra so we had three mid trimester abortion so i think so in last 3 months the number of abortions our place is done is more than what we did for almost 3 years so there is definitely there and these are these are not that patients are scared about covid they have come voluntarily they have told that they don't want pregnancy or we have found there was some problem so i think so there is definite increase in uh, uh, need and probably we have to we uh because one important thing they pointed out is it's not easy to get uh, covid test done but this becomes uh, according to me a priority service because abortion is a choice for the female uh thank you very much dr ashantha dr kavita and dr trivedi over to my colleague dr bhupender okay um i've got a question from dinish call and uh, doc, uh, dr call is asking what's the experience for perinatal transmission in the USA so that's questions dr hetal there i think hetal is there she needs to unmute can somebody else answer just what was the uh, is there any evidence in 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 the US, in in india you know in india i mean whatever data that i have gone through and read mm. that uh, there is absolutely no transmission directly there have been two or three cases only where they have found igm positive 2 hours after birth see igg can pass over to the placenta but igm is that means those children were infected in utero so that is something they are looking at but majority of the births that have occurred there's absolutely no intrauterine transmission also these are very late infections during the third trimester so the effect is on the first trimester i agree uh, thank you for understanding this is hetal from um united states i think our experience has been same as what nandita mentioned uh, we haven't had uh, somebody who got infected and has delivered um, one who got infected in the first trimester to say and has delivered because our experience has been um, 3 to 6 months at the most but it looks like the vertical transmission is is very limited and um, is mainly the, through the contact one one person i think nandita shanta and all will agree in india we can get rt pcr it is swab is possible but igg igm we, we cannot we, we cannot get it done so in fact we are because the kits which we got from one country i don't want to name from where but there were very substandard reporting and lots of false uh, they were sent back actually sir can i just add even the though we are doing the rt pcr the number of tests we are doing are very limited we have to accept you know it's not we are not able to cover all the women who are delivering all the women who are getting electives it's very very in spite of all the recommendation maybe we are evolving over the time probably what is the reason for that 
Sorry, what is the reason for very few tests in India? Is that because they're not available or no. people don't think of them or they're too expensive? If, see, we have got 25 million births, okay? If you take one small state, 50,000 deliveries in the small state of Telangana. Just think, RT-PCR, the health personnel, the number of tests being done, it's absolutely impossible to do 50,000 tests in one small state. Only pregnancy delivery. One, one yes. issue, Anta, one issue is the politicians making decisions that whose test we will do and whose test we will not do. So that becomes a very... Yes, it becomes a very, problem. very difficult situation. Because even for emergency surgery, yeah. I had to tell patients that you have breathlessness, you have a sore throat, you have fever. The test was done immediately and that patient actually needed a for multiple then we fought with the system but uh, easy you ask this I think um just to bring the point what I had uh, said earlier that we do universal testing for elective c-section I think one has to keep in mind where which country because we are all this medical fraternity from all over over the continent, right? So it depends on your country, your resources. And that's why I think there was a comment about uh, delivery, why we are doing it, but that's in United States. That's the policy we have it. But you have to modify the testing and in the place that you are, the availability, the resources. But I think one way to do is symptom triage, right? You can triage with the symptom through the contacts, through the temperature screening, and try to think like how in HIV pandemic, I think the same message that we are giving to people, think everybody at that point, we used to think everybody was HIV positive AIDS, right? Unless proven otherwise. So in COVID, we are following the similar guidelines. Think that somebody is COVID positive unless proven otherwise. So that's a good way to go around if your resources are limited. If even if you do the test, remember there's 30 to 40% chance of a false negative. So you can never be sure that your test you have done, it's negative and the patient is, that's what has been, we are seeing among the patients. And when you look at number of the, some of the doctors who are, and the healthcare personnel who are coming positive, in spite that's of- That's why, I know, that is why it is very important to follow universal precautions, just like HIV, when the HIV epidemic started, universal precautions for everybody, body fluid separation, that we're in that same situation again. But Sunita, you know, in our country, the contact tracing is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, the way they've been working so hard on contact tracing, it's really worked wonderfully, especially in the city of Mumbai, where I live. There are yeah. about one and a half lakh uh, people already, you know, who are infected. And uh, the contact tracing... You know what? That is commendable. 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 Contact tracing, you guys are very good with isolating them, right? You're putting the sign yeah, like outside. I think that's amazing. That is not happening in the United States. There's no contact tracing. There's no isolation. And that's really um, very poorly done here. You know, Hedra, yeah. my driver's you know. next door neighbor had uh, COVID. So the entire family, because they live in one room houses, was mm. shifted to a municipal school in an isolation unit. Five families were shifted immediately. So, I mean, they're doing a fabulous job. Yeah, I, I agree. I really believe that they're doing a fabulous job with the limited resources they have and with unlimited resources Absolutely. that we have. And unlimited resources that we have in the United States, it came to me as a revelation that they were not doing contact tracing. So listen, so every time you went in the hospital, every patient's name is written down. Every visitor's name is taken down in a list. They're given a mask. So I asked the chief of staff, I said, a, a patient came and did a C-section four days earlier. Then she goes to the emergency room four days later with symptoms, with active COVID infection. Oh my God. So basically the people who took care of her are never notified. So I called the chief of staff and I said, how come you're not notified? She said, Sunita, let me tell you something. The reality is there is no contact tracing in America. And not, I mean, I don't want to say in America, in the place I, I work in. So the next day, because we questioned this, the next day they stopped taking all the names. So I said, what the heck are you taking names for then? If there's no contact yeah. tracing. Exactly. Yeah, when, 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 when
135 minutes into the session. So I just wanted to ask, uh, this is the longest session that we've ever had. So Bupinder and Anju, do you have any more questions? Otherwise, we can see, but this is a woman's uh, forum. Uh, exactly. We learned that. Anupam, you can't have a timer on for us. <laughs> So we'll say bye bye and then can I end up with a with a, a question, but sort of a comment from a, from one of the um, uh, people uh, uh, posing the questions? They said that in a year's time, because we've got COVID around for a long time, most hospitals will get used to having a separate COVID section, including a labour uh, section, and it'll just become a normality. And I was, and they wanted to know what people thought about it, really. But uh, anyway, I think uh, that's one comment on that. I think it depends on the number of patients that uh, uh, that city or that particular hospital sees. If the volume is high, I think they will be. So I know of hospitals in New York, especially in Queens and Bronx, uh, where they are having a, a special uh, floors and um, units. So it depends, I think, going down the road, depending upon the number of patients, your volume, I think guidelines will tell those hospitals. Can I make a small point, Bupinder, if you allow? Yes, yes. Yeah. Fine. Uh, see, I was just talking that I had an interaction with a very good MLA. Uh, this MLA is the richest MLA when he fought, 700 crore. But he's not a politician, typically. So he was handling the quarantine of one section. So he's handling the entire quarantine of Mumbai. He is available on his phone till 3 o'clock. And the way in which he is mastering the quarantine means he himself is staying in his flat. He has sent his family to uh, another uh, building. So I think so. There are there are good points. Uh, Sometimes, especially if you have a politician who is well placed in terms of funds and all, and most important is common sense, and is bothered about people. We have a leader who is bothered about the country. That's a different um, issue. But uh, the quarantine part is taken so nicely care of. Uh, the tests are less, but that is why you know the number of cases are not as much as world would have expected. Yeah, I think India is actually from the UK point of view. You're doing much better in terms of yeah. contact tracing than we are, and 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 USA is. And uh, and I think we've got a lot to learn um, from 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 India on that. And there are a lot more. You know, we're there earlier. Um, and then we've got an issue here about more uh, black and ethnic minority doctors and people dying from it, which um, I don't know if we'll do comparisons in the future. Anyway, I think we, as Anupam said, we've uh, run over our time. But you're a fascinating lot of people. And thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, so thank you so much, Bender and uh, Anju. I must... Uh, um, you know, thank all the all the speakers, the moderators. This has been really uh, very lively, and uh, I have to say that the enthusiasm was so palpable. Thank you so much uh, for for finding the time, and just wanted to share with you that next month we will have His Holiness the Dalai Lama address us, and we will come back to you with details. And of course, we have a session planned up in in two weeks with uh, aspects of COVID and different surgical practices. Thank you so much. Uh, good night. Bye -bye. Have a wonderful I have a question. So how would I get the Zoom link for the Dalai Lama presentation? Would I get well, it? Yeah, of course we will. We will be able to each one of you. Thank you okay. so much. You have to be the Thank first you. thousand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night in India and good day. Bye-bye. Yeah, good night.